In this lecture segment, we'll extend the dynamic allocation concepts from the last lecture to include creating arrays of dynamic size. And we'll introduce C-alloc, an M-alloc cousin. The sample program for this segment does a fairly simple task. It asks the user for a number of integers, then reads that many ints, and prints them back out. Saving the ints obviously requires an array. But the interesting thing is that we cannot predict the size of the array in advance, not knowing what number of integers the user will enter. With fixed sized arrays, we'd be caught between making a small array and not being able to deal with large numbers of integers, or making a larger array and usually wasting most of its space and uh, still not being able to accommodate very large numbers of integers. What we need is an array whose size we can set after knowing how many integers the user wants to store, a uh, dynamically sized array. Now, C does not offer such arrays directly, except in its lightly used C99 version. But we can use pointers and mAlloc to make a pretty effective equivalent. And recall that a pointer to the start of an array can be indexed just like an array to get to the elements of the array. Let's combine this with mAlloc's ability to give us a memory area of any size, and that means we can set up a pointer to a memory block is on line 24 here, and then treat it like an array. If, as in our example, the user is asked to store size ints, let's say 6 as the initial input you can see down at the uh, bottom here is, then uh, in that case, we'd be calling mAlloc to create a block of memory large enough for 6 ints, the same number of bytes as an int array of that size would have, which is going to be size times size of int. If we point iBlock to the memory block, then we may use iBlock in the same way we would an array, indexing it from 0 to size minus 1. And here's what we'll get. We've got iBlock pointing to a 24, assuming 4 byte ints, 24 byte block of storage from the runtime heap, which we're going to treat like an array. Now, the divisions into elements are just my artificial diagram, by the way. Memory is memory, once again, but we're going to treat it as though it's a set of six integers. We could pass this to a function like readem here. That expects an int array, since, of course, all that ever gets passed for an array is its initial address, and readem won't know the difference. So, readem will read the user input into our memory block as shown now in the diagram. Note that you need to multiply by size of int in the mAlloc call down here. Just asking for size bytes would be insufficient. Each integer occupies several bytes. And as you can see, after creating the memory block on line 24, we pass it to read them to scan in the required number of ints, and then to print them, and we'll look more at print them in a moment, to print them out. And then, importantly, now that we're done after the printum call, now that we're done with the memory block, on line 27, we're free to, or we call free, to free iBlock. And question one, I lied just now. We're not exactly freeing iBlock on line 27. What should I have said instead to be completely accurate? Coming back from a pause on that, per the prior lecture, line 27 frees iBlock's target, the memory block. It frees this thing up here. It doesn't free that thing there. The pointer iBlock itself is not freed. It's just a local variable, and it wasn't created by mAlloc. I should have said that line 27 freed iBlock's target. And this may seem like a minor point, but it's important. The pointer and its target are distinct entities, far apart from one another in memory. Only the target is part of the runtime heap and needs freeing. Now, I intentionally wrote printm in a somewhat fancy way, well, it's not atypical of professional code. Look at that while loop on line 14. It's supposed to iterate size times and print each successive value in the array as it does so. Trace that code carefully. Be sure you understand what's going on with the star vowels plus plus and all. And let me ask you a quick uh, in-lecture question about it. Would it be okay to have written it as while minus minus size like that instead? I did say earlier that pre-increment uh, and pre-decrement value uh, computations are a little bit faster, right? Or would there be a bug if I did that? 
And what would be the bug if so? So coming back from a, a pause on that, assuming size is 6, for instance, consider what the values of size minus minus will be, the way I'd originally written it, uh, on each execution of the while. Size starts at 6, those values will be 6, and then on the next time 5 and 4. The post increment, or post decrement, I'm sorry, has the old value of size, not the newly decremented one. This is good, since it means the while will be true the first six times and then terminate before doing the seventh iteration when size is zero. But a pre-decrement would have the values 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and the loop would execute only five times. So using a pre-decrement here would be a bug. This kind of off by one bug is quite common in any language, and one good way to diagnose it, by the way, is to try an actual concrete example, like I just did by assuming size was six and tracing what the code would do. And while we're looking at printum, be sure you understand what I did on line 13 here. I wanted to have different labels on each call of printm. You can see down in the output that uh, I label different things with uh, different initial uh, strings there. And uh, I passed a string constant to printm, a character pointer, to parameter label. Uh, so when I call printm here, its values are, and then uh, that gets passed to uh, label. And then I pass label as the format string to the printf here. Since label has no format specifiers in it, there were no other printf parameters needed in line 13. So that covers our program up to uh, line 27 here and the output that goes with it, entering the six integers and then printing their values back out and freeing the block. Now, just to make the point clear, we're going to do lines 29 through 31 here and we'll ask the user to print another number of integers, which as you can see down here is going to be Eight, and uh, we'll create a new memory block of that size instead. But after we've created the new memory block, line 32 prints the contents before I've called read them. And as you can see in the output with the label uninitialized M alloc, it's garbage. You should always assume that memory returned from M alloc has uninitialized garbage, just like any other C variable. But question three here. There's something interesting about that garbage data. Looking at it closely, especially the middle values there, do they look uh, familiar at all? And can you explain why? So coming back from that pause, yeah, they look familiar. They're part of the content of the memory block. We just freed the six values that were entered. Well, apparently the 12 and the 23 got trashed up somehow and turned into large numbers. Uh, question four, is that just a coincidence? Or is there a reasonable explanation for it? And don't worry about the first two values for the moment, just those middle values. Did the values from the prior block of six integers somehow get copied into our eight integer block, or what? And coming back from a pause, no, they didn't get copied. Our new block is the same area of memory as the six integer block. Because the prior block's space was freed on line 27 and is now being reused pictorially up here, we freed this whole area here on line 27, and then when we got a new 8 byte or 8 uh, integer block, we wound up with the same space plus another couple of integers being used, as the adjusted diagram here shows. And apparently the data that was in it, or at least part of it, survived the recycling process. The reason the first two values were trashed, and I just put dot dot dots in there instead of the values that you see in the output, the reason they were trashed is that free must mark the block as available for reuse. And it does this by writing some information into the first few bytes of the block, writing out or wiping out prior data. Okay, but free at least makes sure my pointer doesn't point to the block anymore, right? In other words, after line 27, I block the pointer no longer points to the 6 integer, integer block from the first set of data, right? Right? Now, think about it. You can answer this just knowing how C parameters work without knowing the details of free. Where is I block going to be pointing after that free call? And coming back from the pause, I block is passed by value. Free gets a copy of I block. 
Both the original and the copy point to the block to be freed in the runtime heap, but free has no way of modifying the original iBlock pointer, since it has only a copy of the iBlock pointer. So iBlock continues to point to the storage that was just freed. Now, this set of questions illustrates three important points and two traps to avoid regarding allocated data. Point number one, malloc returns memory that has trash in it. Point number two, free doesn't wipe out the data in the freed block. It just trashes part of it to mark it as free. And the part that gets trashed will vary from machine to machine. And point three, after a call of free, the pointer you passed to free still points to the now freed data. The second and third points mean you can try to use the data you just freed and sometimes you'll get away with it. The pointer hasn't changed and some of the data hasn't either. But this is another unlucky bug since it might not show immediately. So trap one, never use just m allocated data or two traps really. Trap number one, never use just m allocated data without initializing it. And trap number two, never use data you just freed. Not even for one last glimpse of it in the next line of code. Your pointer still points to it, but it's subtly and partially trashed by the free call. Now, there is a way to get dynamically allocated data already initialized to zeros. The calloc function is a close cousin to malloc. It allocates space from the runtime heap, just like malloc, but it initializes the space to zero bytes, all zeros. And it takes two parameters and multiplies them together to get the total size to allocate. That's just in case you're too lazy to write the multiply yourself. This two-parameter arrangement fits well with dynamic array allocation. You, you give the number of elements you want as the first parameter, the size of each element as the second, as we do down here on line 37. And as you can see from line 38's output, initialized calloc down here, the allocated space contains all zeros. So you may want to prefer calloc uh, for allocating blocks. Now, note by the way that at the very end here, we didn't free the final calloc block, did we? We did one just to play around with it, but then we never passed it back to free. And this is technically a bug, but it won't cause harm in this case because the program is about to end anyway. When your program ends, the runtime heap whether its content has been freed or not, continues or ceases, I'm sorry, to exist along with the rest of the code and the memory. So freeing that last block is sort of like recycling your bottles just before the world is about to end. It's a nice gesture, but it's not essential. However, it is good style to do the free call anyway, and I really should have added it there. You never know when you or some other programmer will add more code to the end of the program and effectively put off Armageddon. In that case, your uncollected trash could cause problems. And then a final bit of external research. Our external research problem for this segment has to do with the library functions for block allocation. The family that includes malloc and calloc, for instance. You'll probably find online references of good quality, a better resource for this than KNR itself, though either will do. The question I want you to answer then is, Say I've allocated a block of a thousand bytes, and I find I'm only using the first 500 of them, and I'd, I'd like to free just half of my memory, the latter half, keeping the first half allocated. What single function call do I write to do this? Show the actual code before you look at the answer. And then again, coming back from maybe five or 10 minutes worth of research, the answer is that you can use realloc, which I mentioned in an earlier lecture. Realloc is often used to size up a block, but it can be used to size one down as well. It accepts either a larger or a smaller size and adjusts the block accordingly. And, and by the way, it almost always keeps the current block and, and just marks its latter part as free space when you reduce the block's size. So here's the code then, assuming that blk points to your block. You simply write blk equals realloc of blk comma 500. 